ahead and get started. Good afternoon. This is Transportation Committee Chair Deb Barber. It is Monday, January 10th, 2022. Before I call the meeting to order, I would like to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is causing us to alter our usual procedures. Due to the ongoing pandemic, Council Chair Zelli has determined that it's not reasonable or prudent to conduct in-person meetings at this time. Accordingly, Met Council members will participate in this meeting by phone or other electronic means, and this Transportation Committee meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021. Because we are conducting the meeting electronically, all votes must be taken by roll call. Before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether there is a quorum. With that, Becky, can you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Here. Cummings. Ferguson. Fredson. Here. Gonzalez. Sterner. Here. Zirin. Present. Barber. Here. So you have a quorum present. I call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Transportation Committee meeting for January 10th, 2022. Our first order of business is approval of the agenda. Did If there were no changes or additions to the agenda, we can move on to our next order of business. All right, seeing and hearing none, uh, the agenda is improved. Our first order of business tonight is our public hearing for the TPP. So we will now convene the public hearing to take comments on the draft amendment to the 2040 Transportation Policy Plan. Uh, Greg, could you pull up the presentation, please? The Transportation Policy Plan is the region's guiding document that translates a shared vision for the region's transportation system into investment plans and decisions that help and maintain that system. There are two investment scenarios included. The current revenue scenario includes revenues that the region can reasonably expect to have through 2040 based on our experience and current laws and allocation formulas, including inf inflationary growth. The increased revenue scenario includes revenues that the region might reasonably attain through policy change, laws, or decisions that increase funding for a set of prioritized pro projects and programs. Next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide, Greg? <clears throat> All right. Uh, the proposed amendment would revise the Metro Transit system in the current revenue scenario to extend the B line to downtown St. Paul, include the E line from St. Paul to Edina, add the F and G line selected for 2021. It also adds or updates the increased revenue scenario with the H line and seven remaining arterial bus rapid transit candidate corridors identified in the Metro Transit's net, net, network next and removes three formerly recognized corridors. It also adds six highway freight projects to the current revenue scenario from MnDOT's Minnesota Highway Freight Program, the competitive statewide process that allocates between 20 at 20 and 25 million each year to the highest for, highest highway freight needs in the states. Uh, could you go to the next slide, Greg? The projects that are being added are listed here on the right, and it is includes um, add six freight projects, 47 million over multiple years. There is 117th Avenue reconstruction and modern modernization in the city of Invergrove Heights. I-35, I-49, 494 interchange improvements in the city of Bloomington, Highway 212, Rural Freight Safety Project in Carver County, I-94 eastbound lane improvement project in Woodbury and Oakdale, Highway 10, 169 Ramsey Gate Gateway Pro Project in Anoka County, and Sherburn County 33 reconstruction and realignment in Sherburn County. Could you go to the next slide, Greg? You can see the full amendment at metrocouncil.org slash TPP. Anyone who wishes to can provide comments to find to best find time for those who wish to speak. We may use time limits for comments. Individuals will have three minutes to comment and representatives of organizations will have five minutes to comment. The session is being recorded and live streamed. You are currently muted for all of those who have signed up to speak and will remain muted until you're recognized to speak. When you speak, state your name, your place of residence, and the organization you represent, if any. If any. 
Written statements are also accepted. You may email any comments to public.info at metc.state.mn.us. Once you've spoken, the host will dismiss you from the meeting and you can continue watching on the meeting's live stream. So our speakers tonight, give me one second. We have eight people signed up to speak tonight. And the first one we have is Zinul Rahman. Welcome. All right, we can circle back. Um, and Zinul joins us. Um, the next one I have on my list is Benjamin Kwam. We'll go to the next one. Um, Anthony Headland. Okay, next one I have on the list is Bailey Waters. Hi, can you guys hear me? Hi, welcome. Yep, I can hear you, welcome. All right. Hi, I'm Bailey Waters, and I am representing the Transportation Committee of the St. Anthony Park Community Council. Um, I am a resident in St. Anthony Park, and um, I just wanted to comment on specifically the freight, freight side of the plan. Um, I'm really a proponent of the BRT additions and appreciate that um, on the freight and highway projects that are being added. Um, I know they've gone through a selection process that analyzes the costs and the benefits of each, um, but I believe this process overvalues the time that is spent in congestion and undervalues the amount of emissions that are produced during construction. I don't think that the citizens commute changing by just minutes a year and what is saved in emissions through through these lane expansion projects um, outweighs the environmental impacts of how roads are constructed and will be maintained in the future. Additionally, studies have been done that show that congestion is only relieved for a short time um, when these projects are passed and that congestion returns shortly after opening a new lane. I'd like to see the studies performed for the benefit cost analysis of like these freight and projects in the lane additions um, that exclude the benefit of save time since it's shown that congestion is not um, actually relieved in the long term and that is not proven as a long term benefit. It's not in the best interest of our metropolitan area to continue to support sprawl as this continues to contribute to greater emissions. Um, I'd encourage, encourage the BRT and other transit funding to be assumed in future budgets like transit was, like the freight was according to page, 20, 20, page 21 of the amendment, where it was stated that the freight project additions do not reflect a change in overall rev regional revenues since the TPP already assumed that the federal freight funding would continue in the future. I just want to encourage that the transit funding would be assumed as well. Um, and thanks for letting me speak today. Thank you very much. Uh, we're on to our next speaker, who is Sam Rockwell. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sam Rockwell. Uh, I am at 4108 Colfax in Minneapolis. I'm the executive director of Move Minnesota, uh, which is a transit advocacy and policy organization. Uh, I'm also a lecturer at the Humphrey School in the Urban Planning Program and at the University of Minnesota's uh, Urban Studies Program. Um, I, I appreciate, uh, like the last speaker, the transit investments in this plan and in this uh, amendment. And, and I wish there were more, and I think there's room for more. But, you know, the, the Transportation Policy Plan Amendment ultimately fails uh, in some really fundamental ways. And we need only look at the plan itself to see that failure. 
And so I, I want to take the opportunity to walk through that. So on page 31 of the plan, there's a chart. And that chart summarizes how the plan impacts transportation emissions and in the metro. And the chart reveals that the no build scenario uh, gives us a, an emissions reduction of about 31% against a 2005 baseline by 2040. Now, this is significantly uh, less than being on track for Minnesota's statutory Next Generation Energy Act, which asks us to achieve a, an 80% reduction by 2050. And so the TPP fails in placing us on, on that path and in particular fails in placing us on recently established national uh, targets. The president has established a 50 to 52 percent reduction target by 2030, as has the United Nations, just eight years from now. But the plan goes in the wrong direction from the no build scenario. Once we get into the uh, the revenue scenarios, the current revenue scenario, the emissions increase from the no build scenario, and then in the increased revenue scenario, the emissions increase further yet. So this means that we have a system where the more money the Metropolitan Council is receiving for this plan, despite all of the fabulous and critical transit investments in this plan, the worse our long-term future becomes with our rising emissions. And this, you know, this is just unacceptable as a 2022 plan, and, and I hope that you agree, and I know that this is in the process of reviewing this, right? I mean, President Biden has described climate change as the number one issue facing humanity. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres describes climate change as pushing humanity to the brink. Governor Tim Walz, who appointed all of you, declared that climate change threatens the very things that make Minnesota a great place to live. And I'm sure that you as my council board members know this too. Uh, and, you know, but knowing is not enough. We collectively have to act and, and ultimately on this plan, you have to act. You have to act for you and you have to act for me, for your children, nephews, nieces, for my kids. I have a seven-year-old, Patty, uh, who loves to read. I have six-year-old twins, Francis, who sings all of her uh, communications, and one, Maggie, uh, who is incredibly imaginative. None of them will be old enough to vote by 2030, when we are supposed to have halved our emissions. So the decisions made here today, and by other bodies, by every other body in this country and around the world, are determining their future long before they have a voice. And they're determining all of our own futures as well. So action means rejecting this plan and rebuilding a plan that calls for dramatic and comprehensive expansion of our transit system. As I talked about, there are major investments we, we should. Webex assistant is enabled to save audio highlights. Whoop, something else is going on. Um, and we have federal dollars to add uh, to add to that, which is really exciting, right? We need a plan that explicitly sets targets. Uh, around the need to reduce driving consistent with MnDOT's provisional target um, and with established policies in Hennepin County, St. Paul, Minneapolis, St. Louis Park, and other of your jurisdictions, um, and just a way to find less carbon intensive materials. So it's an incredible moment of obligation and opportunity that we are at and, and that you have. And it's my fervent hope that you take uh, Secretary Buttigieg's uh, words Part that inevitably every transportation decision is a climate decision, whether we acknowledge it or not. If we succeed at this, we are part of the solution here at one of the greatest challenges our species has ever faced. But if we underperform, someone else has to pick up our part. And that's not the Minnesota I want to live in. It's not the metropolitan area I want to live in. I know that we can do better, and I'm asking you to take this plan back to the drawing board. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments. Um, we're on to our next speaker is Will Shore. Welcome. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Council Members. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to thank Sam for that uh, passionate and very well informed and argued uh, set of comments. 
Uh, I'd like to share three thoughts with the uh, council today. Uh, the first is I want to thank and congratulate the council and Metro Transit for your work in developing and implementing uh, the arterial bus rapid transit lines that we have today. They have really proven themselves and um, uh, while we're not the only region in the country that is is doing great work with bus rapid transit, uh, we were very, very early and, and, and first on a, on a lot of uh, measures of bus rapid transit and uh, your, you and your staff are to be commended for that. Uh, no one would have wished it, but the COVID uh, pandemic has really proven the wisdom behind some of the BRT uh, investments. Uh, we see really positive ridership, uh, especially on BRT lines. And, uh, and uh, I hope we be we learn from that going forward. And I, and I think the amendment in front of you today uh, is demonstration of the fact that you have learned from that. So thank you for that. Uh, second, we want to thank you for running an exemplary process around uh, redoing the, the first BRT map that Metro Transit came up with. You ran a really great public process asking for input both on the criteria that would be used to develop that new map and then how that those criteria would be applied. And uh, uh, we participated in that process and uh, not all of our recommendations were taken, uh, but that's fine. And we just want to thank you for running, again, an exemplary process, both on the, the criteria side and then applying those criteria in a transparent way that in the end really made a difference. Um, the Metro Transit changed its original set of recommendations and we, uh, uh, in, in accordance with really thoughtful input from the public, and, and we applaud you for doing that. Uh, so we hope you take those recommendations. And that brings me to my third point, that East Metro Strong and our members uh, didn't introduce ourselves at the very beginning. You've heard from me before. Uh, a number of cities, two counties, Ramsey and Washington County in the East Metro and, and many large employers in the East Metro coming together, not just for transit, um, uh, to serve their employees and customers, but uh, in support of economic vitality in the whole East Metro and, and really in the region. And we fully support these amendments or this amendment as it relates to bus rapid transit. And uh, again, congratulate the work that went into that and hope that you adopt that part of the, of the transportation policy plan. Uh, it's really produced a map and an investment plan that will support both the East Metro and the whole region and May I say, by extension, the whole state. So, uh, kudos to the to your staff and everyone that has brought that forward. Uh, this being a genuine conversation, uh, I, I I have to end by saying I'm moved by Sam's comments, and uh, there's a lot of room uh, for improvement in the rest of the in in the rest of the amendment, honestly. And uh, it doesn't quite get us where we need to go. So I hope that these. Uh, these lines and this proposal around the ABRT map will be the foundation for additional work going forward. Uh, the president and Congress have provided a lot of money uh, to us to, to build on this foundation, and I look forward to working with you to uh, use that money to get us to where we need to go. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, on to our next speaker, who is Buddy Wheeler. Welcome. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunities to speak. My name is Betty Wheeler. I live in St. Anthony Park in St. Paul. I've been a member of the Transportation Committee of the St. Anthony Park Community Council for nine or 10 years. Uh, again, I appreciate uh, all of you board members uh, being willing to have an open discussion with the citizens. My comments address certain parts of this plan, but are also addressing a lot of the Met Council's long-term planning. I agree with Bailey Waters that the Met Council has been overvaluing congestion. I agree with Will Shore about the tr rapid transit lines and how much uh, improvement they are, gonna, are making already and will make in the future. And with Sam Rockwell about the lack of other transit aspects and that we have to act now about climate change. First of all, please remove all goals for road or lane expansions to existing roles. Stop following 1950s designs and thinking. When the Met Council plans now, 
what will be put in practice for a uh, place for infrastructure will last another 50 years. We do not have the luxury to wait another 50 years to make serious transportation changes for reducing climate impacts. Scientific data says the last seven years was the hottest on record. Scientists used to project it would be at least 30 to 50 years before we reach a tipping point. Now the data from near the pole suggests we may already be reaching that tipping point in this or the next few years, or at least this decade, literally now. There's no time to waste. This is urgent. You, the Met Council, must have a different vision and provide the leadership. The individual cities and counties can't do what needs to be done without you. There is no way we get, we'll get many people biking or walking for daily errands or using transit for daily errands or work in the rural areas anytime soon. That means people in the urban Twin Cities, especially Hennepin and Ramsey counties, are at the tip of the spear we Twin Cities urbanites must overwhelmingly drop transit, biking, and walking for most of our transportation in only the very next few years. You know the statistics the, that emissions from transportation are now the largest sector. We cannot expect everyone to buy an e-vehicle. Many people can't even afford their first vehicle, and our utility grid is not ready to have that much expansion over only a very few years. Every additional lane makes livability worse. And the illusion that it creates or decreases congestion is rapidly shown false because it induces additional traffic. What we need to have you think about it is substituting road expansions by prioritizing at the very top money for the following items, including pass mon through money to counties and cities or, and or design coordination, et cetera a lot more convenient aspects for transit. Possibly free transit fare, the psychology of free versus an easy even a dollar, or a, at least only a dollar um, nominal amount, a price that doesn't rise every few years. Better bus connect connectivity, on-time reliability, frequency of departures, and demand that drivers do not exceed the city street limits speeds better or, and more and warmer shelters for buses and light rail stations in the winter, better and more consistent snow removal around bus shelters for accessibility, 100% electric buses and all buses wheelchair accessible, better biking and pedestrian safety with all bike lanes barrier protected, all urban roads that have bike lanes be speed limited to no more than 25 miles an hour, Make a goal for ultimately non-arterial city streets to have roundabouts at every corner. They are proven much safer by, for bicyclists and pedestrians and actually more efficient for a high traffic flow throughput, at the same time reducing pollution and fuel consumption from idling vehicles. More bike lane connectivity throughout the Twin Cities urban area, sidewalk infill throughout, livability improvements, better air quality, less congestion, et cetera, everywhere, stormwater quality improvements. Prohibit semi-trailer freight trucks from driving on residential roads. The only road building should be truck-only corridors through industrial areas, such as that corridor pr proposed in the Northwest Area Study from about 15 to 20 years ago. Minnesotans have been asking for more livable cities. Anyone who's traveled to older European cities know they enjoy much more livable cities. Why? In large parts of their cities, there are no semi-trailer trucks at all. Their streets are too narrow. Also, it is so much safer to bike and walk those streets because they are narrow. The cars that are there drive the streets much slower too. We could have much more peace and quiet, better air quality, less congestion and vibration, more bike lane and sidewalk connectivity, et cetera, if we prohibit long haul freight semi trucks running through our Twin Cities urban area. Build truck hubs and warehouses out beyond the outer ring interstate system and along the railroad lines at the urban edges and bring good transit to those hubs for the work, warehouse workers, the local long haul drivers, and other drivers who are staying overnight to sleep. All ocean going, railroad, and similar freight containers should be diverted around the city completely. Possibly explore the idea of an underground electric powered freight con system convenience. More livable cities will also attract new residents, bringing increased density and reduced sprawl. Reducing sprawl should be one of Met Council's highest priorities because every additional road built and sewer and water and utility systems 
all have to then be maintained in perpetuity in the future, and they only increase driving. The urban sprawl uh, and infrastructure maintenance is costing us way more than homeowner property taxes will ever pay. I realize some of this is beyond the specific purview of the Met Council, but you have the ability to lead the city's and the county's transportation in the urban area. So it is really important and incumbent upon you to have that different vision and be providing the leadership. I thank you for the time you've allowed me. Thank you for your comments. Um, we are on to our next speaker, who is Joe Kendrick. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Kendrick. Um, I am a resident of St. Anthony Park in St. Paul. Uh, I live within a block of both the 94 and the 280 corridor, so I can see the interchange between those two highways from my kitchen window, hear traffic noise, and smell the fumes every day. Uh, and I agree with the previous speakers that, um, while well, some of the transportation, the transit investments in this plan are steps in the right direction, it feels like the transit is an afterthought and the uh, highways and car travel are the real thrust of this plan and all of the transportation planning that happens at every level of government in this region. I think that's disappointing. Um, I think that we need to, at some point, and I hope it is this year, and I wish it had been decades ago, say, enough is enough. These high, these urban freeways were a mistake. They've been terrible for communities. They've destroyed, uh, especially black and brown neighborhoods uh, when they were built, and they continue to poison the air that we all breathe in um, every day and contribute to early mortality and increased risk from diseases like asthma and COVID-19 today. Uh, and we need to be pushing fast to not expand the highways and get more traffic flowing more freely and more quickly but reduce the highways and reduce vehicle miles traveled until one day in the near future, we can all do almost all of our travel uh, by foot or by wheelchair or by bicycle or by transit. And I appreciate that there are a number of levels of government involved in this question. Uh, and it's not just a decision that any individual body like the Met Council can make, but uh, as previous speakers have said, I want the Met Council to be a leader on this, on pushing for as aggressive a VMT vehicle mile travel reduction as we can possibly hope for, and as aggressive a transit investment as we can possibly hope for. As previous speakers have said, I appreciate the bus rapid transit investments that are being made, uh, but I think it's too little and too slow. And even just in the few years I've lived in this neighborhood, overnight service on the green line and frequent service on the green line has been considerably reduced. So let's get the train we've got now moving more quickly. Let's get these bus rabbit transit lines up and running as quickly as possible. And let's under no circumstances expand the urban freeways and eventually try to reduce and get rid of them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, so that's the end of our list that I have right now. So I'm gonna call the three names of the people. I, I don't see them on the line, but I'm going to just in case. Um, who had signed up um, originally to speak, and one is Zainul Rahman. Right, the next one was Benjamin Kwam. And then the final name I had was Anthony Hedlund. Okay, not hearing from any of them, I will check. Um, in with Sarah to see if anyone else has signed up to speak. No one else has signed up to speak. Very good. Well, I do want to thank all of you for attending and participating in our public hearing. Um, we appreciate your, um, hearing your comments. Uh, for the rest of the public and anyone who wishes to comment, public comments will be accepted through 5 p.m. on January 24th. And to comment on the proposed 2040 Transportation Policy Plan Amendment, you can write the council at 390 Robert Street North, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55101. You can email the council at public.info at metc.state.mn.us. You can record a comment on the public comment line at 651-602-1500. Uh, 651-291-0904.
At the close of the public comment process, staff will prepare a summary of comments along with a revised amendment. Uh, seeing no other uh, people here to speak, this hearing is adjourned. And now we will return back to our uh, uh, to our transportation committee. Uh, our first, our next order of business is approval of the minutes. So it's the minutes from the December 13th, 2021 meeting. Did anyone have any changes or additions to the minutes? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Fredson, I move approval. It's moved by Fredson. Is there a second? Coming second. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the minutes are approved. Our next sort of business is the TAC report. We have David Finley here. Welcome, David. Good evening, Chair Barber and Council members. David Finley, thank you very much for having me um, in the new year. It's nice to see all of you. Um, just one, one, one quick thing to update you all on. Uh, we did talk about a bunch of stuff at the last TAC meeting, but I think the, the most important thing and the most um, the the best thing to, to talk about with you all tonight is uh, re relating to the IRA um, um, pilot project that will be continuing through uh, the month of March, and that's when it is supposed to end. Um, just for a quick reminder, IRA is a, a, a essentially a, a wayfinding app for folks who are blind uh, or low vision, and it also has been expanded to to other disabilities as well. But essentially, um, this is a this is a a service that uh, the Met Council is is providing uh, free of, free of charge to to riders um, at their transit locations. Um, we were very excited that it that it uh, was chosen to happen by all of you. Um, unfortunately. It's a really bad time to have a pilot project. Your numbers clearly won't reflect what what um, what uh, a, a non-pandemic uh, ridership would look like. Um, so we had a pretty we had a pretty good discussion at our last meeting on Wednesday, um, and TAC members w were in full agreement that it's it's a great project, and the numbers obviously were disappointing. Um, I. I 30 people a month or 30, 30 uses a month. Um, and then, then there were 20 unique users um, who, who had been using this throughout the, throughout the pilot program. Um, it was brought up by one TAC member that those 30 usages per month, he, he would just account for all 30 of those if he was using transit in a non-pandemic uh, uh, world. So, just a, just a reminder to all of you that that those numbers definitely would not reflect the usage of this fantastic um, 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 uh, resource for folks with disabilities. Uh, it's it's great for people who are who are blind, low vision, but also other disabilities. Uh, people who have processing issues, brain injuries, developmental disabilities. Um, it really does assist in navigating the system. Um, um, I know that that uh, the airport has seen MSP airport has seen a lot of success with folks um, and, and high usage there with this with this same exact program. Um, so just a just an ask a reminder, uh, the numbers definitely don't reflect uh, the community usage and I'd be happy to chat further with any of you or answer any questions right now. But thank you chair and council members. Thank you, David. Are there questions or comments from council members? Um, so I have a question then. So like the, you said, mentioned, this is a pilot program. Um, so what is the like next steps with the program? So according to um, to your folks, the, it was it, the, the next step would be to then evaluate the data, um, obviously with the caveat that it that it that it's that there are pandemic numbers and then decide on 
um, if it's something that that you want to implement um, um, on an ongoing basis. Do you know what the timing on that is? And if you don't, I'll I, I'll go dig up the numbers. But so, so so the pilot the pilot ends at the end of March, um, and then and then a decision has to be made to either extend the pilot program. Um, or to do a, do a more permanent implementation of uh, IRA at at all of the transit locations and and bus stops. Very good, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, definitely provides a benefit, and so and it's it is hard to judge things in this current environment right now. So, um, I see um, a hand up, uh, Councilmember Chambliss. Yes, um, yeah, I would I would agree. Um, thanks for giving us that that update, um, David. And <clears throat> I think that we need to um, consider in March potentially extending uh, the pilots. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get more information and have some more strategies so that users are more aware of the tool um, and have the opportunity to use the tool. Um, it would be a shame to take such a good program and prematurely make a decision. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would be looking into extending um, the evaluation period uh, when we get to that in March. Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to note that in the chat, uh, Bridget Reef of the MAC has put in a note that they provide that service free of charge at the airport, that it's well, well liked and a fantastic resource, as David noted. I think that's an important um, caveat to the conversation. All right, um, one last question, David. When do the pilot start? That is a good question. I don't have it in my notes. I think it. I think it might have been a sit like, kind of guessing here. It might have been a six month pilot. I don't think it was a year long pilot, um, but it it did. Yeah, I can, I can find that out probably pretty quickly here. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, also I think we want to you know as we're looking at it, the the time both the pandemic and also the timing of the year. Um, when I look outside, it's super cold day today, and things like that might be could affect things. So um, I'd be interested in that as well. All right, any other uh, questions or comments from council members? All right, well, thank you, David. Appreciate it. And next, we are on to other reports. We have MTS Director Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, and good afternoon, council members. A few items for you today. The Met Council will host a workshop to introduce prospective applicants to the 2022 regional solicitation for transportation projects. So this relates to the $180 million in federal transportation funds that are expected to be available for allocation in 2026 and 2027. Uh, the application period will run from mid-February through mid-April. And so this workshop is for prospective applicants uh, scheduled on Friday, January 21st from 9.30 to 11 a.m. It'll provide an overview of the regional solicitation and answer any questions folks may have, and it'll be recorded and posted online. So it's a good resource for applicants, and uh, we can provide a link to that, but it's available on our, on our application website as, as well. On the finance side, we've received final calendar year 2021 motor vehicle sales revenues. So for November, uh, council receipts were 26.9 million, which is a, a big increase over last November. Uh, similar numbers for December at 27.6 million, which was flat from 2020, but uh, even above the November number. Uh, this brings our total for the year to 360 million uh, for the council, uh, which was 20 million above the forecast of 340 million. Uh, so more than more than six percent above forecast uh, for the year. So significant motor vehicle sales tax, uh, high high rates uh, uh, for any car that you can buy. Uh, right now, and it, even though it is somewhat difficult to find uh, inventory uh, in the in the current environment, so uh, we did see good uh, sales tax receipts. On the contracted services side, uh, last month in the in the committee's Metro Mobility Info item, uh, we reported on a driver shortage in contracted services. Uh, we're currently about 15, uh, 15.15 percent 
uh, below our desired counts, and that translates to over 100 vacancies across all of our different service contracts. Uh, in December 2021 and continuing this month, uh, this shortage has been compounded by an increase in COVID-related absences as both testing and case counts have increased and combined these factors have begun to affect on-time performance on Metro Mobility. Uh, we have not denied trips, but are beginning to see on-time performance uh, decrease as we anticipate uh, challenges in the weeks ahead to deliver these critical services. So both in response and in preparation, uh, last week we asked Metro Mobility riders to consider canceling or not scheduling non-essential travel. Uh, as even a small reduction in trips helps us preserve service quality and uh, improve uh, trips for, for those who need travel uh, with our currently limited number of drivers. We're also increasing other measures to recruit and hire operators. So continuing safe practices with testing, mass compliance, cleaning, and other efforts. We're continuing our grocery delivery efforts as this is a critical need and reduces exposure compared to uh, driving people to grocery stores, instead bringing bags of groceries to people. Uh, a KSTP news story last week that I don't think we have time to share the whole thing today, but a two and a half minute feature uh, showed one of our contractors efforts and, and uh, plugged job opportunities across all of our, all of our providers and can uh, share that with the council. Finally, uh, and maybe most significantly in this report, we're working with our contracted service providers to offer competitive pay. So currently the operator uh, starting wage is around $18, $17.75 or $18 per hour. And this simply now is not competitive against freight package delivery or school bus rates and the incentive packages that, that are being offered. So right now, uh, Madam Chair, we're working to increase starting pay to a $20 minimum wage for drivers. Uh, this does remain more than a dollar below Metro Transit starting wage, uh, and the corresponding contract rates or contract amendments uh, are, are going to begin soon. Uh, the increases will vary by contract, but in each case, we expect them to be below 5% of each contract's value. Uh, and we believe that this change to a $20 minimum will greatly help our contractors hiring. Madam Chair, we'll continue to update the committees as we face the long-term challenge of driver hiring and the, what we hope is a short-term impact uh, to that of COVID-19. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Are there any questions for Director Carlson? All right, seeing none, I will move on to Metro Transit General Manager Koistra. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee men, uh, members. Uh, in recognition uh, that this is a public business meeting, I just want to briefly acknowledge that over the past uh, couple of months, we've suffered passing of employees and former employees. And this has included the loss of two employees since the last transportation committee meeting. Uh, John Humphrey and Tom Humphrey were three and four decade employees who grew up in Metro Transit to key leadership position. And as you can imagine, uh, there are many at Metro Transit who knew all these individuals who we have lost and as close, both as close colleagues and as friends, and they're they are grieving those losses. I just want to assure this group that we are doing what the best we can to provide the space and support that is needed for this process. And for those of you who have sent words of encouragement, we so very much appreciate your kindness and support. So thank you very much for that. Uh, moving on to the COVID update, since the last Transportation Committee meeting, December 13th, Metro Transit has had 134 positive COVID cases reported. Uh, I'm not sure if this includes this, but I was just told a few minutes ago that we had 32 positive, new positive cases reported today. Uh, we have recorded more than 100 COVID cases in December, uh, which is the second highest total of any month since the start of the pandemic. Uh, we ended 2021 with 420 positive cases as compared to 342 cases in 2020. Uh, January is proving to be even more active, as you might imagine, with more than 70 cases reported through the first 10 days. Um, so like so many businesses, we're experiencing some significant staff shortages. Uh, 
this is affecting bus and train oper operators, facilities maintenance workers, and police officers. So our intent is to ensure that all areas are continuing to address critical tasks in their respective divisions as we manage through these shortages. It's a difficult task. I want to assure you that operations staff work uh, night and day to match available operators to work assignments that need to be filled. Uh, we also use Roger Alerts and social media and our website, which whichever are most appropriate to communicate with customers when we're not able to fully meet service obligations. From a staffing standpoint, uh, we our base staffing is 16 full-time and part-time weekday operators below our ideal. Uh, that's where we start from. And we are, all, we are down currently almost 80 operators due to COVID. So our total operator shortage is near 100 at this time and growing. Our next bus operator hiring event is on January 15th from 9 a.m. to noon. And then again on January 19th from 7, 4, 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, at our instruction center in Minneapolis. Uh, moving to New Year's Eve free rides, uh, on a more positive note for the 10th year, Metro Transit partnered with Molson Coors to encourage residents and visitors to celebrate New Year's Eve responsibly uh, with Miller free rides in, on all Metro Transit bus and light rail routes. And despite some last minute New Year's Eve event cancellations and smaller crowds, 13,636 riders took advantage of these three rides. I wanted to mention this today because it is more than just a ridership promotion for us. It is a chance to show uh, one of the many ways that Metro Transit helps make our community safe and better throughout the year. And it has the support of our local and state law enforcement community. So we're very pleased uh, that Molson Course Tours wanted to uh, sponsor this again in 2021. Uh, you might recall we offer a similar program on St. Patrick's Day, and that partnership is also with Molson Curl Coors, and it was started in 1997, and we again look forward to offering this this year. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll accept any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Wes. Are there any questions or comments from council members? All right, seeing none, uh, we can move on to the remainder of our business. Um, our first order of business is approval of the consent um, agenda. There are three items on consent. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the items on consent. Comments move to approval. Second. Move, move by Kathleen, seconded by Frenson. Uh, is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Ziren. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the consent agenda is approved. Next, we're on to our non-consent items. The first item is 2022-9, which is review of the Metropolitan Airports Commission 2022 through 2028 CIP. And we have Russ Owen here. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and uh, Council members. Um, pull this up real quick. Uh, I'm Russ Owen with uh, Senior Planner with MTS. And I'm here to discuss uh, the analysis and review of the MAC CIP, uh, which is done on an annual basis uh, in accordance with the Minnesota statute 473.621. Uh, the MET Council has uh, the following rules in aviation planning. Uh, prepare a regional aviation system plan, which we'll be uh, working on later this year. Uh, review metro airport and community comprehensive plans and environmental evaluations and to review the MAC capital improvement program. Um, the legislative requirements for the capital improvement program review are outlined in the Minnesota statute 473.621. And they're the following, to review the uh, public participation process, to review uh, all the projects. Uh, this is normally handled through the TAC tab, transportation committee and met council process, and to approve projects that meet significant effects criteria uh, the significant effects criteria are 
um, twofold. One, a financial um, uh, financial criteria uh, of any project that meets uh, any project that is greater than five million dollars at MSP or two million dollars at reliever reports, and also meets the significant effects criteria of the law, which is a location of a new airport, a uh, new runway at an existing airport, a runway extension, uh, runway strengthening other than routine maintenance new or expanded passenger handling or parking facilities uh, for a 25% or greater uh, capacity increase and uh, land acquisition associated with any of this criteria. Uh, if projects meet both the financial and significant effects criteria, then the project would need to be approved by the council. Uh, there are no projects uh, in the 2022 CIP that uh, meet those criteria, so there is no project that needs to be approved by the council this year. Uh, so the 2022 findings uh, include uh, the MAC has followed uh, and has uh, been a part of a formal public participation process for many years. Uh, the process includes public hearings, sending out notices to affected communities. Um, an affected community is any community that shares a border with a MAC owned airport. Uh, if a community believes that uh, they're affected by an airport, uh, but don't share a border, they can submit a request to MAC to be included on the mailers and information for affected communities. Uh, the MAC also held a public hearing on November 1st at their Planning, Development, and Environmental Committee uh, meeting uh, at 10.30 in the morning at, at uh, MSP Airport. Uh, there was no one who participated in that public hearing. The CIEP uh, also identifies uh, adequate funding uh, which mostly consists of passenger facility charges, federal and state grants, and MAC funds. Uh, many of the projects in the capital improvement program are in the out years, and those projects are mainly demand-driven projects. Uh, these projects will be initiated when the demand is such that the projects will need to begin to accommodate uh, capacity and growth. Uh, and with and as stated earlier, uh, uh, Bridget Reef, who's the Vice President of Planning, Development, and Environment uh, at MAC, is also here, and she can answer any specific questions uh, if you have anything, spe uh, any specific project questions. And I also believe that uh, the Executive Director uh, Brian Ricks will be at the uh, full council meeting uh, at the end of the month to uh, provide an overview of what's happening at MAC. And uh, with that, I can stand for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-9. So moved, Ferguson. Moved by Ferguson, is there a second? Fredson will second. Seconded by Fredson, is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Ziren. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion is approved. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Next, we're on to business item 2021-329. It's the Gold Line 2022 through 2026 Capital Grant Agreement. And we have Chris Beckwith here to present. I think you're on mute. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, I'm here to present this business item here today. Um, this is business item 2021-329, which is the capital grant agreement between the Met Council and the Joint Powers Board. Um, the Joint Powers Board is comprised of both Ramsey and Washington counties who grant funds to the Gold Line uh, BRT project, and they are providing the majority of the local funding for the Gold Line BRT. So this is a capital grant agreement from the Joint Powers board to the Met Council. The Gold Line is a planned 10 mile long bus rapid transit way connecting St. Paul to the eastern cities of suburban cities of Maplewood, Landfall, Oakdale and Woodbury. It's the first BRT of its kind in the Twin Cities operating primarily on dedicated bus lanes generally along the north side of I-94. 
The, this transit investment will be providing frequent all-day transit connections to the East Metro to jobs and housing, as well as providing better access to the greater Metro Transit transitway system, including direct connections to the green and purple lines in downtown St. Paul. So the Joint Powers Board has previously granted, um, had previously granted in the current agreement about $75 million to the project for 2020. 2021 and through March 31st of 2022 and that covered project development and engineering tasks and the business item before you covers the next capital grant agreement to be executed in early 2022 that would extend all the way through 2026 which would cover revenue service the um, opening day for the gold line and the new grant agreement will allow us the project to continue to progress through the remaining months of engineering and into construction later this year. And as I mentioned, all the way through opening day. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the strong support from our corridor counties, Ramsey and Washington, both at the county board level, as well as the county staff that are integrated into our project management team. Together, we made great progress over the last year moving through the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration's New Starts program, and we look forward to additional milestones in 2022, as well as uh, groundbreaking on construction. So this proposed action today is that the Met Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Capital Grant Agreement 21I042 with the Gold Line Joint Powers Board in the amount not to exceed $148,840,529 $840,529 for calendar years 2022 through 2026. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve, approve business item 2021-329. Fredson will move approval. It's moved by Fredson, is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion is approved. Thank you, Chris. All right, that concludes our business for this evening. And um, just wanted to say we'll put both items, move them forward as non-consent. Um, as Russ mentioned, the uh, MAC CIP um, usually travels with um, uh, presentation, annual presentation from MAC. So we will take that up at a regular council meeting. And I think the gold line should probably go non-consent as well, if everyone agrees. All right. Very good. Then we're on to information. So our information item tonight is the TPP modification, and it has to do with the RBTN, regional bike barriers, and regional truck freight corridors. So we have Steve Elmer here to present. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Steve Elmer. I am a planning analyst uh, with MTS division, and I'm going to walk you through um, three uh, of our regional transportation uh, modal networks uh, that we're going to be considering tonight. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, first of all, we will, um, I wanted to start with just giving you some background on what is uh, TPP administrative modification and how it's different from a uh, transportation policy plan amendment. Um, for changes uh, in a regional plan that are appropriate to be handled through an administrative modification, they cannot impact the fiscal constraint of the plan or significantly change the plan's uh, list of funded projects. They can cover minor project updates and regional studies if they do not directly impact the funded projects uh, in the plan. Um, Unlike a TPP amendment, they do not require a reanalysis of the plan's uh, impact on air quality and environmental justice, in addition to fiscal constraint. And also, uh, unlike a TPP amendment, they do not require an official public comment process, uh, and they do need to be adopted by the council as the MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region. 
So now I'd like to um, kind of introduce the framework for our three transportation modal networks we're considering and our regional studies um, that were used to develop them. The first is the Regional Bicycle Transportation Network, um, also affectionately known as the RBTN. This was developed in our Regional Bicycle System study uh, back in 2014. We have regional truck freight corridors that were identified through a regional truck highway corridor study in 2017, and also uh, regional bicycle barriers, which were defined in the regional bicycle barriers study and its technical addendum in 2018 to 2019. Um, each of these modal networks have been adopted. They've been included in the TPP and are uh, set as uh, priorities for planning and regional investment in the plan. And all three networks are used in the project selection process and the regional solicitation to award federal transportation funds, as well as in some other competitive funding programs uh, led by MnDOT. Next slide. Thank you. Um, the, uh, I, I'm going to get in a little more detail here on each of these modal networks. The first is the Regional Bicycle Transportation Network introduced into the TPP in the 2014 update. And this is really the region's vision for a backbone arterial network of bike transportation corridors. And the purpose of these corridors uh, is to accommodate or uh, facilitate uh, daily bicycle travel by connecting to and between our designated regional destinations uh, to our regional transit system, as well as between our local uh, bikeway networks. And to use an analogy, uh, really the uh, the backbone network, are, uh, the RBTN, are really the arterials and uh, veins of the system connecting to the uh, capillaries, which are the local bikeway networks in the, uh, the city plans. Um, both uh, RB10 quarters and alignments have been used in the regional solicitation process since 2014. Next slide, please. Uh, regional bicycle barriers. Uh, these were introduced in the 2018 TPP update and then updated in 2020. Um, these are identify what are the most significant physical barriers to bicycle transportation and they're defined um, as the region's freeways and expressways, rail corridors, and rivers and streams. And they're being used uh, in planning and, and investment to prioritize locations for improving uh, bike facilities across these regional barriers, it's been used in the regional solicitation since 2020. Next slide, please. Uh, regional truck corridors or regional truck freight corridors as they're referred to in the plan. Um, these are defined as the set of the Twin Cities highways that are most heavily relied upon by the trucking industry for delivering the region's freight and goods. They were added to the TPP through the 2018 update and are used uh, as a prioritization criterion for the regional solicitation since uh, 2018 as well. Next slide. Uh, so during our 2020 TPP update process, we did hear some uh, comments from agencies requesting the council to identify and implement a process by which they could update each of these modal networks on a more regular basis. So in 2021, we initiated these processes, gave local agencies an opportunity to update these networks. Uh, for the RBTN, this was the first opportunity to uh, introduce or consider major changes to the RBTN, including new corridors um, or major other major shifts or changes. And for the regional bike barriers and regional truck corridors, it was the first opportunity to update them as these are newer uh, to our plan. We intend to repeat this process every two years prior to each cycle of the regional solicitation process. Next slide, please. And so now I want to get more specific about uh, the results of these updates, these uh, modal network updates from 2021. Um, and uh, we have received, uh, so in uh, May of 2021, uh, we gave uh, local agencies the opportunity to propose new bike barriers. Uh, we did receive five proposals for new barriers from two agencies. Uh, they're shown here uh, in the map on the right. 
and we reviewed them to ensure that they met the regional definitions uh, that were provided and are part of our TPP. All five of them met those uh, definitions and were ultimately accepted by the TAB for the 2022 regional solicitation. Next slide, please. Uh, the Regional Bicycle Transportation Network. Uh, this was a process that was uh, simultaneous to, concurrent with the uh, Regional Bike Barriers process. Uh, also in May, they had the opportunity, local agencies to propose, not only propose new RB10 corridors or alignments, but also to extend existing ones or to shift an alignment. Um, that would be uh, a change to reflect uh, changes in their local bicycle or transportation plans. Um, earlier in 2021, we completed phase one of our RBTN guidelines and measures study, um, the purpose of which was to develop quantitative measures specifically for evaluating agency proposals to update the RBTN. Um, we did present to this committee, uh, I believe, uh, early in the study in 2020 um, on that study. Um, and we had measures develop uh, in, in the areas of connectivity, route directness, corridor spacing, social and economic equity, as well as proximity to development. Next slide, please. And uh, so we, in addition to using the measures to evaluate the proposals, we also reviewed them against our RBTN goals and intent. And we, so we did develop staff recommendations to whether to accept or deny each of the proposals. And we shared them with a technical review team uh, that we've been using uh, consisting of agency uh, planners and engineers closely engaged in bicycle planning in their respective uh, cities and counties. Um, and so they were a very effective and useful group uh, to, um, to help us with those reviews. Um, the results of those, um, the results of those proposals, we received 27 proposals from six counties and cities. 18 of those were accepted as proposed and ultimately by tab for the regional solicitation. Nine were accepted with some adjustments that were worked out uh, with the proposing agency staff. And for some of those adjustments that extended into adjacent cities, we uh, consulted with that city or cities, uh, and in some cases, MnDOT staff uh, to get their consent as well. Um, and after reviewing, receiving these uh, proposals and reviewing and uh, determining, uh, going through this process to update our maps, uh, we took it through our TAC and TAB process, and ultimately in September of last year, the TAB um, approved the updated maps to be released as part of the public comment release of the regional solicitation uh, packet for public comment uh, last September. Uh, it was a month-long process. We received 37 comments from 18 individual commenters. Uh, my table here uh, summarizes some of the key themes uh, of the messages, uh, comments that we received. I'm not going to walk through all of them, but it is interesting to note that um, 11 out of 18 uh, lent very strong support for extension of the Midtown Greenway into St. Paul across the Mississippi River. Um, it's, uh, we would note that that is um, uh, within an existing RBTN corridor. Uh, so has the uh, highest priority. It's a tier one corridor. We also received uh, a third of commenters uh, indicating a, a need and support for a separated bike facility somewhere in the Snelling Avenue corridor in St. Paul, particularly where it crosses the BNSF rail corridor and the I-94 freeway. Um, and then we received also very location specific suggestions to uh, make improvements along multiple routes. Um, and those suggestions involved um, requests for new facilities entirely, some maintenance needs, as well as some safety issues that needed to be resolved. So where we have location specific comments like that we have in these top three comments, we will be forwarding those to the appropriate staff uh, at the cities for their uh, consideration. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, we did receive one comment from uh, Scott County that resulted in uh, a need to change the RVTN map. This was really the result of an oversight error. Um, and uh, so we did convene a meeting with staffs from Scott County, from Dakota County, who was the proposing agency for this uh, regional trail alignment, uh, mostly through Dakota County, as well as uh, Three Rivers Park District. And the solution we reached is shown in the map um, on the right. Uh, which would be to remove uh, the unsupported segment um, in red that runs through Scott County and replacing that with a new RBTN corridor through which a new uh, alignment will be designated at some point in the future, but uh, maintaining that entirely within um, Dakota County for that um, segment of the trail. Uh, next slide, please. So now uh, the regional truck corridors, uh, is, this was really a, uh, a two prong process. The first part were um, as an internal staff um, uh, update of the data sets that were used in the original 2017 uh, regional truck corridor study. Uh, we replaced that with an improved uh, data set and more recently available uh, truck volume data. Um, and then Going through that process, we convened a group of uh, county engineers and planners and city planners uh, as a technical review group to kind of review our preliminary uh, analysis results and subsequent iterations through, it was really a subset of our original study technical advisory committee. Um, and then as we updated the data analysis, we uh, it was this reprioritization of tiers, which had a moderate effect on kind of reordering some of the existing highway corridor prioritized tiers to some extent. And those final changes after going through several iterations were, were uh, consented to by this technical review group and also supported through the TAC and TAB process last fall. Next slide, please. Um, in this process, uh, so this was part two of our process, and this was the opportunity we gave to local agencies to propose either a new regional truck corridor entirely or to add a new regional freight facility. Um, we received 14 proposals for new truck corridors and two new regional freight facility proposals. We reviewed them against uh, some minimum thresholds that we specified for daily minimum level of daily truck volumes. Um, of the 14 proposed corridors, 11 uh, met the minimum threshold for daily truck volume and were accepted. Um, we had two partial corridor segments that met minimum thresholds uh, for those overall corridors and those segments were accepted. And then we had one corridor not meeting the thresholds. For the two proposed major freight facilities, one met the minimum thresholds of daily truck trips generated and one did not meet the threshold. Next slide, please. And I just like to wrap up here with the uh, next steps for this TPP administrative modification. Um, on January 24th, we'll be coming back to this committee to ask you to recommend the adoption of these updated uh, RBTN bike barriers and regional truck corridor network maps um, for, and then we would uh, ask um, the same week on uh, the 26th, the full council to adopt these updated maps for inclusion in the 2040 transportation policy plan. Uh, so that wraps up my presentation. I'm happy to answer any uh, comments or any questions you might have. Great, thank you. Any questions from council members? Councilmember Fredson. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just to follow up on a couple of the slides, one on slide seven, I think that was the slide that uh, uh, discussed the barriers, the five communities that, that discovered new barriers. I'm just curious to know if those were oversights from the previous process a couple of years ago, or if there, there was barriers constructed or built or moved forward with over the course of the last um, couple years or if it was because of population growth or growth in traffic or something like that. And then on slide 11, um, related to Scott County, so just looking at that route, I'm curious to know why. Um, uh, you, I think you said it was a 
oversight. Um, but obviously, the route that that, that the the remove segment was, I guess, from my standpoint, appeared to be a lot more scenic uh, versus what what uh, might be moved forward with um, within the boundaries of of just Dakota. So I'm curious to know more background on, on that decision. Uh, Madam Chair and um, Council Member, thanks for your question. I'll start with your last question and we'll back up uh, to the regional barriers question. So for this one, this was uh, proposed by Dakota County. It's a regional trail uh, plan and the red segment that was, I think it was considered um, back in the process. Uh, this is many years ago, um, but it was never adopted in the final master plan. Uh, for that regional trail, and it does not have support from Scott County to run through the Murphy Hanrahan Park Preserve. Um, and I'm not completely familiar with all the issues in that, but it, it was not supported. Um, and so that's why we needed to kind of <clears throat> go away from that. And the uh, the corridor is in is. Uh, consistent with the, um, the existing master plan, which had several options that kind of were parallel to this corridor. So that's that question. Um, back to the regional barriers one, thank you for backing up there. Um, so really, well, uh, so one of our definitions is uh, expressways, which are shown here in red. And so there was, um, to be a regional expressway barrier, you need to have, four lanes divided by a median and a minimum uh, speed of uh, 45 miles an hour. And basically there was construction that uh, completed parts of Highway 212 through Carver County. Um, and so we were adding that one. They wanted to add that one to reflect those uh, physical changes. So that's a common change that we would expect to see in the future with expressway expansions. Um, the rail corridors, um, uh, we're just outside the perimeter of the original study uh, area, and uh, we we allowed them. Um, so the rail corridors and stream corridors in that uh, map were were added for that reason. Yep. All right. Thank you. Just no questions or comments from council members. Um, I'll just make a quick comment. It's really nice to see this, you know, saw the introduction of some of this work a few years ago, and it's great to see sort of it evolving and kind of the continued discussions with the communities, both on the, the bike network and barriers and with um, the freight studies, because, um, you know, I think it's it's really, you can see it really starting to, I think, really take shape and start to be reflected in how we'll be able to fund things, um, especially through the regional solicitation going forward. So thank you for presenting this. Um, all right, one last call. Any questions or comments from council members? All right, well, that concludes everything for tonight. Um, so um, I, with there's no other comments from council members. I'm just not seeing none, then we can be adjourned for the evening. Everyone have a great evening. Bye now.